Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presentation uh, in partnership between TransFinder and NAPT. This is the ninth best practices webinar and the first of a multi part series. Will the best laid plans really work? My name is Andrew Hamilton. I'm the Senior Application Specialist with TransFinder Corporation, and I'll be starting us off for today. For today's uh, webinar, as always, if you want to communicate with any of our panelists, you can use the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel to communicate any questions or concerns that you have as we go on. Now, with that being said, let's all have a uh, let's all be ready for a good discussion today, and we're going to have a few welcoming words from our president and CEO for TransFinder, Tony Civitella. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for the intro and uh, good morning, good afternoon, based on where we are throughout the country. Uh, and welcome to the uh, another webinar. I can't believe this is our ninth best practice webinar that we're uh, being held in partnership with NAPT. And we already have number 10 planned for next week, so look out for that. Um, so today's uh, webinar is titled Planning for School Reopening. Will the best laid plans really work? I tell you, that's a question that everyone's been asking. Uh, and it's all that concern. Will really, will the social distancing on the school bus, is it going to work? And we're getting tons of our own clients are thinking about how, how our soft is going to help and I'm thinking, man, how can this possibly be? So a lot of these things are being now questioned and how can it be? And it's, uh, again, they're cropping up. There a lot of people are asking these things. And uh, the past couple of webinars, we've been really talking about the, the details and the plans on the school, school that should be considering. And today, we're looking at the practical side. Uh, the attendees here themselves are going to have a lot of discussion, so I could see that happening. We have an amazing panel presented here today from uh, all over, uh, throughout the country. We have uh, from North Carolina, Texas, and Pennsylvania, and of course here from New York, New York State. Um, I know it sounds like a broken record, but I feel like today is even a, a huge topic. Every week we do this, we're getting more and more people. I feel like today is going to be another record-breaking crowd, and, and these are, uh, webinars it really shows that everyone wants to know these answers. We're all like almost like a holding pattern, right? We're all go like, I'm not doing anything until I get some answers, or or feel like I should be doing something. So I know, it. and then we're getting our own clients are saying, I can't make a decision. Please, someone tell me to do something. So I got it, and I think this is what, as a group, we're coming together. I want to remind you that this presentation is definitely. Uh, being recorded and you can again you can find it off on the uh off our transfinder.com page it's anchored there and then there's a best practice page that's just getting so long and you guys are sending so much great thanks um, if you want continue sending um, your story uh, my, i'm sorry my story at transfinder.com which is really your story so send it to us and again i want to thank the leaders in our schools who are really doing such a great job i'm really helping and and really planning everything's going on in the safest way that how we transport our students. Uh, it's a tall task, I know it. I want to thank Mike Martin for, uh, from NAPT for really the way he's led this organization, really the organization that's coming together. And I love this partnership that we've had. Uh, I know that Mike would we go on next, but I think now it's going to be, I'm going to pass the mic to the, the mic for phone to, uh, to Rick DeRico, uh, PR director here at Transfender. So, there you are at the mic. You like that? Mike, I like Mike. That. Great. Good. Thank you. Thanks so much. But, Tony, yeah. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Rick Rico. I'm the Director of Public Relations at TransFinder. And I want to let you know, Mike Martin is um, going to try to get on and join us. We've had some issues here, so he'll, he will join us hopefully in this discussion. And you may also hear Tony again off camera um, asking some questions as well. Um, we do have an amazing panel. I'm very excited. I'm going to ask all of our panelists to come on right now. Uh, we've got Tim Ammon, Ammon who's the uh, co-owner of Decision Support Groups, um, Jim Pearson, Director of Transportation at Seneca Valley School District, John Ramirez is the Assistant Director of Transportation at Northside ISD, and um, that's going to be changing soon. Are you going public with that? Is that okay? So you can share with us that in a second. And then Patsy Hudson, Assistant Director of Transportation at Pitt County Schools in North Carolina. So uh, thank you all so much. We had a, I'm just gonna give a little bit of an alert here that, um, spoiler alert, 
we had a great conversation the other day and um, very rich information. But I think also, I think everybody who's on, uh, who's attending today um, is going to, this is going to resonate with you because I think that a lot of the concerns that they have, um, you probably have as well. So um, I think it's going to be a lively discussion and some real uh, pointed answers as well. Before we get started, I'm going to ask, we'll start with uh, Tim. We'll just go Tim, Jim, John, and Patsy. Um, we won't always go in that order, Patsy, I promise. You won't always be the last kid, and you know, like with the kid that has a Z for a last name, is always the last one. Um, we'll try to reverse it up. But if you could each just start with a little bit about yourselves, you, um, with Tim, it's your company, and the others with your school district, a little bit about the size, the scope, and um, and then we'll get into the next round a little bit about where you're at in terms of uh, school opening. I'll probably start with Jim. But Tim, just give us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and your organization. Great, thank you, Rick. Um, so uh, my name is Tim Ammon. I'm one of the co-owners of Decision Support Group. We are a K-12 transportation consulting company, work across the country with districts of all sizes. Uh, my perspective, I think today is likely to be a little bit different than Jim's and John's and Patsy's because I get to go home. So I think the kinds of information that I seek out and the kinds of information that I pay attention to in this is not at the same level of detail as theirs, which is why their perspective has been so helpful and so influential on me, uh, because it is a lot of that really ground level stuff. And I think what, what organizations like ours and, and, and mine in particular worry about is the policy and operational conditions that folks like Jim and John and Patsy and all of you on the webinar get put in fairly and mostly unfairly as a result of a lot of the discussions that have gone on to date about how services are supposed to open for 2020, 2021. I think you also find Tim is, an, is your advocate uh, for sure. You'll hear him in this conversation. Jim. Jim, we can't hear you. Okay, we'll go to John and we'll figure that out. Go ahead, John. All right. Uh, hey, Jim, you can start working on the American Sign Language mm -hmm. classes there. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm currently with Northside ISD. I'm the Assistant Director of Transportation here. We have over 1,000 vehicle fleets in total, uh, about 800 and some buses. Uh, we run about 500 and the change, uh, give it depending on the day routes. Um, and I am, as Rick alluded to, I am getting ready to move to a whopping over 100 fleet vehicle in a Bernie ISD. So a little bit of a change, but uh, I, I came from an even smaller district before I came here to Northside. So best of both worlds, knowing the, the, the there's a lot of good things from small districts that big districts can learn from, and there's a lot of efficiencies in big districts that can be brought to smaller districts. So I'm in that weird position right now where one foot in each district, you know, try to go to meetings to different ones. And so uh, in the next couple of weeks, I will be officially the director of transportation at Bernie ISD, which is a neighboring district right next door. Um, the ex officio for uh, the pupil, uh, Central Texas Association for Pupil Transportation um and which is an affiliate chapter of the texas Associ association of people transportation and a shout out for centex we were the first ones to have our uh, uh virtual monthly meeting a couple months ago worked out very well and uh we're looking at uh kind of continuing that it seems like a very good tool we did it again this this last month and little hookups here and there but looking good great great awesome patsy i can't hear you too How's that? Perfect. Um, I'm the current assistant director for Pitt County Schools Transportation. Uh, we run around two 220 buses, and I came from a county with a, a little over 100 buses uh, and hit a, a county with around seven, 800 in between there. Um, I'm the current president for, for North Carolina People Transportation Association, and I've kind of been bouncing around this industry for, for almost 20 years now. So. Great, awesome. And Jim, are you back with us? Well, let's see. Check one, two, one, two. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Jim Pearson, Seneca Valley School District. We're just a little north, about 30 minutes north of Pittsburgh. 
Um, we have 100 square miles that we cover and transport about 8,000 uh, students per day with 150 school vehicles. So um, looking forward to the discussion today. Primarily, uh, hopefully we get our word out as far as transportation people. Most of the stuff I'm seeing that is out in articles and webinars. Um, in fact, I looked at one today, the American Enterprise people have a lot of um, people with uh, ivory towers and uh, it seemed that uh, nobody was there from transportation. So uh, it's good that we're getting the word out so that uh, the people that are making these uh, decisions at a higher level, hopefully hear our voice today. That's great, that's super. I should make a mention that uh, we do receive questions. Um, you can submit questions during this uh, webinar and I am monitoring those as is Andy and Tony as well. Um, so if we get some good questions here, uh, which we always do, we'll make sure we pose them to the panelists as well. If we could go back around the horn, we'll start with Patsy and go the other way. Can you give us just a little sense of where things are at with your district in terms of planning to reopen? Um, I don't know if it's summer school or the fall or some, I know some schools are moving things even to 2021 or at least discussing that. So Patsy, can you start us off a little bit about where your district is at at this point? So we, we don't have a final um, decision as far as um, how they're gonna be opening schools, so to speak. Um, There's some ideas that are still being thrown around statewide. Uh, for Pitt County in particular, I know that we have our, our actual summer uh, brick and mortar programs are, are on hold. We are doing some summer uh, food deliveries still, uh, summer food distribution. And so we're still uh, doing that aspect of it. But we do not have, I guess, a definite plan in place. Um, we are looking at different options and, and folks are weighing in, but we're still kind of waiting for um, some direction from from Raleigh, where where um, DPI, our our sort of governing body, is located, to get a final final decision on how we're going to do that. There are some districts locally that are considering starting school uh, still with the virtual remote learning for maybe their first semester. That's an idea that has been tossed around, but I, at this point, we have not heard anything de definitive from from anybody about how they're going to be officially starting. Very good, thank you. John. Yeah, should leave my microphone on. Yes. Um, so Texas Education Agency just came out with some guidelines and recommendations. And as we were talking about yesterday, a lot of should consider um, the definitively not something, hey, you will all do this. But um, summer instruction, activities and school visits, guidance for reopening and student interaction. So based on that, we're having a lot of reactions uh, of how to do that. So here in Northside, um, they've already committed uh, before this came out that, hey, summer school for June anyway, which is traditionally what, where we have our summer school, it's gonna be distance learning. Um, there's still considerations on the table of what's gonna happen in July. Is it gonna be face-to-face -face August? You know, the conversation, basically, I like how our superintendent said it in a, uh, and there was an article he was interviewed for locally that he said, what are the chances of fill in the blank, whatever option you want. And he said, zero to 100%. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's now with a little bit more guidance and now that we're at phase two here in Texas, we're starting to have things fall off the table, but there's still enough on there that there's a lot of ambiguity. And for example, like here in San Antonio, you know, the, the count is way up there in, in, in the Bear County. In the county I'm gonna go to in Bernie, there's no deaths. Um, so, the, how they're approaching it, they're going to have a, uh, a reduced size graduation on, uh, in next month, but they're still going to have a face-to-face -face graduate, additional graduation, just a lot more space in there, a lot less people. Uh, here, they're doing an awesome job. They just adjusted. Um, they were going to have one in July, uh, trying to do a face-to-face -face type of deal, but now they're going to do an, a neat little hybrid uh, at the schools where students are going to be allowed to come in with a limited number and they're going to kind of, uh, from what I understand, um, rotate them through like uh, picture stations where they can get pictures of those moments, throwing the cap, getting a diploma, but all contact lists and all that stuff. So all the districts are coming up with some really neat ideas uh, to, to do that. So um, it's wait and see. 
Great, super, super. Um, Jim. Um, we are just starting our uh, task, or we're calling it the steering committee for uh, coming back to school in the fall. So our uh, ESY is going to still be remote learning, um, but we recognize in just uh, some of the preliminary talks for the uh, steering committee is that it is, you know, education is a very big part of getting the economy going and uh, you know, parents need a place for their kids to be if they are two working parents and they are, have to be physically on site for their job. So, it, you know, we're definitely taking that into consideration um, that we need to, instead of looking at so-called uh, split schedules or something that may put a burden on the uh, families, uh, we're trying to find uh, something that's going to fit like a five-day schedule. Great. And Tim, you want to give kind of, I know you represent work with lots of different school districts. Maybe you can kind of give us the gamut of what you're seeing. Yeah, I think a lot of what we're seeing is very similar to what everybody has said. And in terms of what's what's most obvious and what everyone has said is that nobody knows. The, the idea that nobody has really decided anything and nobody has really determined anything and that everybody's sort of hoping that that's going to come from somebody else so that they don't have to be the first gopher who sticks their head out and gets shot kind of a problem. And yeah. so, uh, uh, you know, our customers are in the same boat. And, and I think what is most troubling to me about it is that our first district opens school 76 days from now. Yeah. And that's not a hell of a lot of time to figure all of this out. And so, so I think the biggest aspect of this is that we're going to have to, as an industry and as a, as a set of individuals, we're, we're going to have to start advocating for certain things and then, frankly, just doing certain things that we think are in the best interest because it is my concern for all of you that you're not going to get the direction either that you need or that you want, but you are going to bear the full accountability of it. Good. Um... Starting to get some good questions in, but I want to hit a couple quick things first. Jim, you kind of got the ball rolling yesterday in our conversation. You quoted a a Lancaster. Did I say that correctly? I know it's it's not Lancaster. It's Lancaster. <laughs> Lancaster. I practiced that. Uh, superintendent who had us quote that really was like a reality check. And then I asked all of you guys if you're hearing that from your own uh, school. And um, so what was that quote? Do you remember it offhand? Yeah. It was uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Aiken, Peter Aiken from the Mannheim uh, Central School District near Lancaster. And um, he said that uh, the district will make in good faith effort to put protection in place, but offering a completely risk-free environment isn't possible. And he said that they uh, do not want to give families false hope. And so you know, certainly they're doing the best they can, um, and we all are as far as uh, figuring out what this, you know, sanitation and, you know, uh, disinfecting and, and all that as far as uh, on the school buses. Um, but um, in my opinion, the, the uh, uncomfortable truth is that we will not be able to do social distancing on a school bus. And uh, we've seen um, over in uh, King County in the state of Washington that they were saying on their mass transit that they were only going to allow 12 people on a 40 foot bus, which uh, I know in my school district that would be simply impossible. We would have to make five trips, you know, to pick up all the kids that need to make it to school on time. So, um, when we when we look at what they're saying as far as uh, what people can do on mass transit, um, they're not taking into consideration that we have X amount of students that we need to get through doors, and you know by the time that bell rings, so uh, we don't have the luxury of you know having X amount of uh, buses that can continue to make a loop around town to pick up people. So so it, uh, we're in a whole different ball game. John and Patchy, does that resonate with you guys as well? 
Yes, um, that's that's the issue we have is um, we have a lot of places that have huge numbers of students at stops. So you are looking at um, students waiting at those stops being above the number that the magic number that's given for a group waiting. Um, I mean, there's some ways around that, but um, trying to transport the number of people that you need to transport while social distancing and following the guidelines of getting them to school and the time that they need to be at school is, is almost an insurmountable task. It was a little overwhelming. Um, John? It's, uh, so now the conversation as he start popping up is, uh, and, and uh, my boss here, uh, she's been going to a, a bunch of task force meetings and everything like that, and the conversation of, this is what we can do, is, is getting louder now that, hey, um, we can only provide up to X. Uh, summer school is a lot easier to support for us, but the expectation management of what follows after that. Uh, we may be able to support a lot of the summer school programs, but we can't maintain that 12 person per bus for the uh, regular year. So that reality of, of what that looks like, um, in fact, I'm getting ready for a summary statement for my new boss of what capabilities we have uh, uh, and what we expect compared to last year and can we. So yeah, the, the voice of what can we do needs to be loud at the educator administration level. I want to read a question that we have, and it's kind of more a, a statement, I think, than a question by Michael. It says, our buses are already full. Using buses for one to a seat would take all day uh, just to get, uh, hang on a minute, uh, it would take all day just to get them to school, much less getting them back home. We're looking at no more than two to a seat on any bus. Is there, a, you know, he thought about what about masks? Are they going to be wearing masks? Are we adding sanitizers to the front of the bus? What's everyone else's thoughts? Are you are we going? Are we wrong to have two to a seat? That's Michael's question. And um, then thoughts about the driver with a clear screen. You know, um, thoughts two to a bus. You know, this is the kind of stuff that I think everyone's asking. Can are we um, are we putting children's lives at risk by trying to put more? Patsy, you mentioned that this goes against everything you've been learning over 20 years and this uh, about efficiency in buses, bus riding. Yeah. Any, so, anyone want to jump in on that? Go ahead. So the, the training, the, the train of thought for my entire career has been you transport as many students as possible on as few buses as possible for efficiency and safety. And looking at social distancing guidelines and things that are being t sort of tossed around at this point, um, it's almost like relearning everything you know, because taking a 72 passenger bus and only transporting 11 or 12 kids, trying to maintain the social distance guideline would, would mean that you're making multiple trips that are trying to get students to school. And for us, um, we have some routes that are pretty long and students are already on the bus early and school starting early so there there's it's a trickle down effect into how you have to get them there and once it gets there like john mentioned yesterday if we are mimicking what's in the classroom having things where you're only transporting 10 11 12 kids on a bus but you get them to school and they're in a classroom with 15 20 kids i mean yeah but I so, as these guys know, I think the whole discussion is nonsense. I think it's it's almost irresponsible to have it come down from policy people to talk about the fact that we can do this. Because the baseline presumption in all of this is that there's no interaction of anything else other than that's going on other than the fact that we need to physically distance kids. and. I, if nobody else has read the paper, um, there's an economic devastation occurring as well, which means 100 buses that you might have been thinking about to transport 1,200 kids might actually be 80 to transport 960 of them, right? So, so 
So it is the interaction of these two incredibly powerful forces that people are going to have to be considerate of. And to even to, to posit that we can actually do this and provide access to education by transporting 12 kids at a time, in my opinion, is nonsense. And, and I'm probably the only person on the panel here who can advocate for that because my partner can't fire me because he only owns 50% of the company too, right? <laughs> so, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that somebody, and, and I think the industry generally is the folks who have to do that, has to advocate for the idea that this is nonsense and that we've really got to reframe the conversation about if what you want transportation to do is to provide access to education, you focus on the things that John and Jim and Patsy have talked about, which is what can we do? You know, we and will not remove 100, we will not create safety. Like, let's not pretend that we will, because if safety is the absence of risk, we're going to have risk, right? So, so what are the things that we're doing to yeah, mitigate? I always feel risk? like, you know, that people say like better to be safe than sorry, and that's a nice expression. But then I never leave my house ever. Mm -hmm. You know, right. I mean, exactly. Was someone going to say something earlier? Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, if you were not a believer in in data driven decisions before. I mean, that's where we're at right now. You, the decisions for this of what can you do is data-driven decisions. You got to pull out your numbers. You got to put, get, get pen to paper, get with reality. What, what is, what is realistic, and present that. Um, because you can't do it by feeling of safety anymore. You got to. This is, this is what we can do. And everyone knows we're not going to getting a bunch of buses to appear magically. One thing, if you can do that, getting a bunch of drivers to appear magically. <laughs> That's the bigger challenge. I was saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of things. First of all, Tim, you got a couple of uh, amens in here. Uh, <laughs> someone, I think, said, uh, finally, <laughs> someone is saying what we're all thinking. Tim makes a great point. This is nonsense. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of things like that. So don't let it go to your head, Tim, but I think you hit yeah, it. Yeah, well, uh, there's a lot of room up there. Um, so one, so of the other things, one of the other things to think about, Rick, is yes. um, what does it matter whether it's 60 kids or 30 kids or 10 kids? If one kid has COVID-19 um, and he is in on that bus, he's going to be in, uh, exposed, to, you know, everybody else on that bus, whether it's 10 or 12, you know, the bus driver. Um, so those people are going to be exposed. So then what, what do you do after that? Then you got to shut down everything for 14 days. So that bus driver can't come back to work for 14 days. Um, so, you know, there again, that's the uncomfortable truth of it all. And um, I like that expression, uncomfortable truth. Uh, it's that yeah. elephant in the room, so to speak, you know, yeah. nobody, everybody sees it, but nobody, you know, or the emperor has no clothes. Um, one person asked, uh, Don asked, you know, why can't the choice be the parents? Let the parents decide if they want their kids on a bus, if not, so maybe with that built in understanding that there is some risk involved, just like you let your kid go to the roller skating rink and you walk in and it says, there's a sign there that is a risk and that, you know, you're allowing your, or the trampolines, those things always scare the heck out of me when my kids would go to those trampoline places. But um, so, um, I want to get back to one thing earlier and then a couple um, high points here we discussed and I'll get back to some questions um, from the pan from uh, the attendees. But John, you had mentioned and Patsy made an allusion to it as well, that one guidance you have gotten is that whatever takes place in the classroom, that needs to be mirrored on the, uh, at some level in transportation. Is that correct? And are, you know, how does that work? And I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in on that. But that's at yeah. least a concrete something you can visualize. If we're gonna be doing this, this, and this before kids enter a classroom or whatever maybe, or after a classroom, same thing on a bus. So it's not it's not so much guidance we receive, it's kind of like we're, we're going to that point. So it's, it's bottom line is kind of, uh, and that's kind of what I'm taking with me to the new district is, because uh, we, we can all sit around and go, this should be, should be, should be, bottom line is we have to follow district guidelines for those of us that can't just go home, Tim. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so bottom line is when they're building this stuff, we're an education institution, not a transportation institution. So first and foremost, they're going to set up the atmosphere for education. 
once they set that up, now we know what our kind of limits have gotten a little smaller. So if in the classroom, for example, they say uh, the teachers are going to wipe down this the desk as soon as they leave and before anybody else uses it, how do you translate to a bus environment? Well, after the kids get on and off the bus, you wipe down the seat or spray or something. One of the options we're looking at here in Northside is, uh, um, and the, you know, working with our custodians and our support stuff is when they get the, especially in summer school. And right now we're just talking about summer school support because that is possible um, with what we have. So they go drop off the students, they pull forward a little bit out of the way. There's a custodian there with one of their backpack sprayers. We have aerostatic uh, sprayers at every campus. They spray the seats down and then they go off for if they got to do another tier. Um, we, we do have multiple tiers here for even in summer school sometimes. Um, so that's, a lot. Yeah, so that's that's one thing. Um, in the district I'm going to is one tier. Uh, we just discussed that this morning. The reality of how to do that is if that's the case, hey, we just wipe down uh, we the bus when we get back because we're only going to deliver once and that's after every trip at the station, you wipe down, you're good to go. Um, the question to, to ask ourselves is the deep cleaning, the wipe down and the spray. How do we want to do that? Do we have the equipment on board to do that? Uh, we're, we're looking at once a once a week is possible for summer, but you gotta regardless of how, what we think how effective that is in, in the transmission on surfaces, we have to give our communities a feeling of we're doing something. Um, hand sanitizers. Uh, the guidance from Texas was. Uh, recommend hand sanitizer uh, for everyone in the bus so we're going to find ways to do that and and if it comes down to until we get something that will mount and, and make sense there uh, we're gonna the driver's gonna have a little bottle and as soon as they get on here you go squirt get on um so we're gonna find ways to do that but we're gonna find a a, a way to give that feeling of we're doing something now parents it's up to you do you feel that's enough to put your kid on the bus Patrick, yeah. you going to say something? Well, I mean, just kind of piggybacking on what he was saying, um, I think that when you're when the two when the students get on the bus, regardless of and what Jim mentioned, whether it's one or twenty one or forty one, they're all coming up the steps, past the driver, down the aisle, and there has to be something as far as the cleaning part of it, if it's part of the pre-trip and the post-trip, if it's you know in between runs, if it's at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, depending on how many tiers you're running. Um, you know, the hand sanitizer is flammable. It can't, we, we can't transport it on the bus. So, and we, but we can't mandate to parents what they can and can't try to do to, pick, to, to protect their children. So it does return back to a parent's decision, putting them on the bus, transporting them to or from school, and us doing our part to a point, because it is an uncomfortable truth that we cannot guarantee that we're going to keep them from getting, whether it's COVID, whether it's you know chicken pox, flu, whatever it is, once they're on the bus. Right. Yeah. Um, Tim, were you going to say something? Well, I, I think again, you know, what what I think is so interesting about the conversations that have occurred is that everybody is focused on the what to do, and I think really what the direction that everybody has gotten has left people with is to consider the idea of why are we supposed to be doing it, right? What's the intent of doing all of these things? Because if what we're thinking about is the intent aspect of it, it allows us to focus on risk mitigation and not risk resolution, mm -hmm. right? So, oh. so because this is all a mitigation problem. And so, so what are the things that we're doing to lessen and lessen the risk to increase the safety, knowing that it's not zero or one, that it's somewhere between zero or one as the superintendent has identified, right? So I think, it's it's important to think about that question of intent and every time we get an opportunity to talk to either an administrator or a policymaker to focus on that issue of intent and to focus on how what we're doing contributes to what John spoke about in terms of managing the public perception. Because the, the question really is that question of when does in loco parentis start? 
right? And it's, it's Are you speaking so, Latin to me now? You're going Latin on me. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's Wikipedia. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's important to sort of note those kinds of threshold events that are causing these things and say, we're doing everything we can from the point at which our responsibility starts to the point at which it ends. We're going to need some help on either side, and we want you to know what it is. But we can't me, make this zero. We can't make the things. We can't make risk zero. There's a lot of um, comments about this. I'm just going to kind of um, kind of blend them together. You know, some people say like parents don't have a, some parents don't have a choice. That's the only way they get their kids to school. Um, but you know, some was like, can you can we just have parents opt out of transportation? Um, I know in New, I believe in New York. It's, you can't, I mean, you can opt out, but if a parent decides tomorrow, you know, after going months without transportation, that they want transportation, they are guaranteed to have it. So you can't really make plans according to that. One couple quick things, and then I want to get to a, a point that you guys made yesterday. One said, like, if there's an executive order to social distance, won't we, this is from Vanessa, won't we be liable if we ignore social distancing guidelines? And then Bob asks, um, what are the thoughts of having the student, students and parents signing a transportation contract so they understand and accept the risk I think that you're all mentioning about a child riding a bus? I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that, any of those points uh, regarding uh, the executive order and uh, being liable and also this uh, transportation contract. Thoughts? Um, if I can jump in real quick on the liability, because that's always, and then there's all, not just for this, but there's all sorts of other things for liability. Um, and I, I'm assuming that the question is, are, is the bus driver or us as transportation, the one that being the ones liable, the beauty of it in a, in, in the public world here is that, Hey, I'm going to, and even at the rec level, I'm going to tell you what, this is what I'm going to do. They got lawyers and all sorts of other people that are going to look at it and tell me we've accepted that risk. You know, what your plan is good, the liability risk there, where it's acceptable. So the decision is going to be made by someone higher than me. And quite frankly, after it's passed, um, I'm, I'm not, the liability is not hovering over my head anymore because I've attempted risk mitigation, liability mitigation as much as I can. The, the, the district has made that decision. Um, as far as executive order, depends what, like, you know, you got, you got governors and states and, and, and uh, attorney generals you know, rescinding city uh, guidelines. Do you wear masks? You can't require, you, you can't tell me what to do, but tell me what to do. So stay informed. <laughs> so, and then get with your district leadership and administration, give them the data, the, the correct information, and they're going to let you know what the district is willing to accept. Um. Tim, you mentioned something really interesting yesterday. Um, you, know, you talk about like, there's a lot of what ifs out there, but there are some things that we, there are resources that you do have at your disposal that you can start to maybe rethink how education is actually delivered. Talk about, you know, buildings that maybe, maybe there's more walking involved uh, in the future. Can you get, I don't want to steal your thunder here. So go sure, ahead, sure. Tell us a little bit about how to rethink maybe what maybe the next chapter of education may look at least temporarily. So, I mean, from, from my perspective, you know, one of the things that we've, we've talked about and I've written about is this idea that the assumption has been that education is binary. It's either done in a school or done at home. And, and what I'm suggesting that districts think about, and granted, this is, I recognize again, that I mentioned earlier, 76 days to think about it in, but, but we, we can think about, if we can deliver distance learning to the house, why can't we deliver distance learning to a room in a library or a room in a community center or a room in other public spaces where we can provide kids with an education that takes the transportation question off the table because it's in walking distance to where they live, right? I mean, there are, by my count, thousands of government buildings across the country that could serve as facilities for education. And what I'm suggesting is that districts may want to consider the use of those things, even if they're temporary, um, as a mechanism to try to address some of these concerns. Great, that's super. Um, let's see here. Um, Jim, you mentioned um, that it's important not to make plans like in a, in a vacuum, that you really got to be involving 
multiple departments when you're uh, presenting things to the administration, maybe to say, here's what we think we can do. Can you give me a little right. bit of a sense of that? Right. As far as like any of the ideas that we would come up with in the steering committee, we need to make sure that there's people there like the, the people from your technology department, um, because our routing software talks to our student accounting software. Um, we need to make sure that those user defined fields uh, are able to pick up. If you're going to go to an ABC type uh, format for your kids and categorize them such, is there a way to identify, say, a homeroom um, that is homeroom A, and so all those kids would go into that group, homeroom B, those kids would go to that group, and then you could uh, do your, your scheduling accordingly. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, the type of people that need to be part of that discussion, um, like the IT people um, and the people who maybe are um, making those schedules, like the principals, assistant principals, um, they all need to be part of that. And uh, on top of that, whenever you're putting together your plan, the communications department has to be able to get that information out to the parents so the parents know, uh, you know, it's paramount that they know what to expect if they're going to decide to send their kid to school. This is what we can do and this is what we are not able to do. Very good. I mean, by the way, so for every point, there can be sometimes a counterpoint, right? Um, I remember my dad telling me, you know, the ramps um, on the curbs uh, for wheelchair users, that that for a while that was a good idea, but then the negative side of it was that people who were blind would sometimes not. That's when you started putting the bumps in the the uh, in the ramps to make sure that a blind person would know that um, they're coming to the end of a of a sidewalk. I share that to say, Tim, some people liked your ideas about using the centers and using other uh, areas for uh, education, but then they said that could get in the way of. Um, you know, teacher contracts, could that become an issue? So you always see this. Yeah, point, absolutely. It's not, it, believe me, it's no panacea, but neither is transporting 12 kids on a bus, right? So, right. so no. what, and I'm not what, disagreeing, by the way, I'm just yeah, saying. What, what we need to be is about alternatives, right? So let, let's think about what alternatives might be feasible. I mean, I think there are a thousand things wrong with it. How do you make sure all those facilities are clean? How do you make sure they're safe? How do you make, there's, there's a million things that could go wrong but there might be a thousand things that can go right, and that thousand things might get us to November. And I think the thing that has come across in almost every single webinar I've seen or been a part of is this idea of being flexible. Um, I know that the transportation departments are, I've seen a lot at the administration level, but um, for an entire institution, it's hard for an institution to be flexible, uh, maybe, but uh, individually, I've, individuals, I've seen so many people just find ways my boss always says, you know, his expression is always figure it out. Just try to figure it out. There's a problem. We got to get around it. So figure it out. Um, so, uh, John, you mentioned um, the idea of going to administrators with some specifics, you know, specific resources um, that you can do. One of the things I think you mentioned yesterday was even maybe uh, the whole idea of how many miles are you, you know, how far out can you bring a student before you start transporting them. And uh, did you have more decision, you have probably more resources at your disposal than you may be aware of. Am I summarizing that okay? Yes, it's just, you really have to look, you know, we're, we're look and, and we, like Patsy says, we have to fight years of training of how to be more efficient in an inherently inefficient system. And now we're being asked like, okay, throw that out, become super inefficient because what's more important is just getting them there. So based upon that, like here, we're a three-tier system. We can't wiggle much more out of that. Uh, we can if, which we love to do in the transportation world, we can do that if um, it, it's not you know, spreading out to school so far. So you wanna keep three tiers, give everybody a ride. By my calculation, elementary school for every one bus, you know, like you said, you need five buses. So that, does that mean, hey, five days in a week? You split out the the ridership by five and spread it out. 
um, that's about 60 kids um, in a full size bus. So it all depends on this stuff. If you are a one tier system, um, hey, there's your answer right there. You're going to have to become a three tier as much as in those smaller communities. Um, if you're two tier, that's probably the simplest thing to do. Um, so those are resources that you can look at. Don't count on getting more drivers and buses. Just put that in there. You have what you have, plan on that. Um, if some more comes in and, and the heaven's gates open up and all your wishes come true, great. But plan for what you have right now. Um, is splitting up morning and afternoon a possibility for the schools? So our job as transportation professionals is to tell them, this is how it looks for us in that scenario. Um, and, you, and we all know here that you got to provide options to your bosses because they definitely don't like hearing, this is the only thing we can do. So you throw that out there and let them decide, are they willing to pay the cost for whatever that decision is? And is the community gonna be able to support that where my kid will only go to school once a, once a week? That's great, that's great. Um, the idea, yeah, I was saying, this is the only plan, take it or leave it, versus here's some options of, based on what we have in house. And then um, if something changes and your fortunes uh, increase, then super. Patsy, you had a unique idea. Um, I'm not gonna say anything more. Just tell us you had some approaches to uh, you're going to your administrators. Well, you know, as we were talking about it yesterday, everybody wants to tell you the coulds and the woulds and the shoulds, but I mean, tell me what I can't do. Tell me what is absolutely not going to fly across the board. Is there something that is a complete deal breaker administration wise? Is there something that just cannot be worked around? And we can work around everything else. Like if you if you cannot have anybody arriving on campus past a certain time, tell me that and then I'll work backwards to get there. Um, you know, we, we run into things like looking at, um, we, we are multi-tiered, and if you are looking at students going partial days, if you're looking at a hybrid environment for uh, remote learning and brick and mortar learning, then you look you run into um, families who who will have daycare issues because if a, if a student being in or out of school based on how their learning is going, whether it's remote or whether it's coming to school and maybe the siblings for whatever reason end up on a different schedule and parents are looking at daycare for one or both of their children in addition to trying to work their jobs um, that who are the job market is already stressed and nobody's going to want to push that envelope to where i can't i don't have daycare i can't come to work so all of those things intertwine because you run into parents who are already stressed they're already pushed to a limit a system for us who under normal circumstances are asked to do more every year with less resources and not lessen that level of service that we provide and now we're asked to possibly provide more specialized intricate design with potentially less resources than we would have normally with potentially less staff because we transport medically fragile students. We hire um, a division of the workforce who may or may not be retired from another job and they may be considered part of an at-risk group who don't wanna put themselves at risk. Safety assistants, uh, EC drivers, regular drivers who in a, industry that already has a driver shortage, we're cutting our resources again. So tell me what you will not allow and let me work backwards and get there. I absolutely love that. Um, I really do. I, I was saying yesterday, um, there's a chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, it's known as the love chapter. And it describes love, but it's only a couple of verses to describe what love is. Most of it is what love is not. It's not that we can all relate to. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking and all this other stuff. So I like the idea of saying, here's what you cannot do. Because we can, there's so many variables of what you can maybe do. 
oh man, if you just pigeonhole those numbers of things, you cannot do this. Like for instance, one one question we just had, um, and I think we talked about this yesterday. Um, can you turn a student away at the bus stop? Um, one person asked, are you going to take temperatures at the bus stop? And I think all of you had said that is not that is not happening. And if a kid is at the bus stop, the kid is getting on the bus. Is that right? So um, that's a what you cannot do. You cannot turn a child away. Boom. I have an answer there. Um, Jim, you getting ready to say something? Well, just yeah, that uh, you know, that's always been kind of the norm uh, as far as you know, especially the first couple of days of school. You know, they were standing out on the road, and you know, it looks uh, lost, and you know, the bus driver should pull up and open the door and say, "What school do you go to?" You know, and if they're going to the school that, you know, then get them on the bus, and then you can figure it out once you get them to school. You know, they'll know what bus to get on at the end of the day. So. Um, but yeah, to, to leave a child stranded, cause you don't know, you know, if a kid comes to the bus stop and doesn't have a mask, you know, and you don't know if you're going to turn them away, mom and dad are probably already gone. So now, you, you know, you'll end up on the six o'clock news pretty fast, you know, if you leave them stranded. So, um, so you have to, you know, I already told my contractors to make sure that they have a box of masks. Uh, set aside next to the driver. So if a kid does get on and doesn't have a mask, they at least have something to give them. Um, but uh, I also uh, had written down as far as, uh, you know, getting ready for this uh, steering committee that we would ask, you know, make sure, and this is part of the communication out to the parents, that they make sure that before that kid leaves the house, that they take the temperature. You know, it becomes part of the morning routine, you know, before you eat breakfast, we take your temperature. So, um, and uh, that's what we have to do right now during the summer. If we're going to the building, um, there's a nurse there that's taking our temperature, but typically what I do is take my temperature at home uh, before I even drive to the school. So um, that's gonna have to be pretty much a normal routine for all of us going forward. Tim, you really you wanna say something? No, I mean, I think when we think about how this whole thing is going to go down, you know, and my my sense is that districts have three options, right? And the three options that they have is change supply, change demand, or change the solution, right? And, and the changing supply component of it is thinking about routing, thinking about partnerships. Um, what What districts often do is serve in a rugged individualistic way, which is like, I'm going to do this myself come hell or high water. Um, and and that's the sort of operations mindset. And one of the things that I would suggest is start to look for partners, whether those partners are adjacent districts, whether they are contractors, whether they are other service providers, because that offers a set of resilience and flexibility that you just won't have with your own system, right? So, so thinking about how to change supply, then thinking about how to change demand, you know, one, one of the things that happens is every every place we go, people say, well, the kids that are a mile and a half out are eligible. Well, why are they eligible? They're eligible because you get funding for them. That doesn't mean you actually have to provide services to them. So if you change demand by suggesting that you're going to have to push eligibility boundaries out, does it cause problems? Sure it does. Yeah. But can it be part of an answer? Yeah, it might be able to be. So you've got to think about both the supply and the demand side of things. And in doing that, and this is where the, the concept of using other facilities comes from, also think about just changing what the solution set is, right? If the solution set is a binary home to school choice on a binary school bus or not, we have tremendously limited our flexibility. We've tremendously limited our ability to be resilient. And we've tremendously limited our ability to be responsive. So I would argue that we have to get outside of this binary paradigm that we have around most of the things that are feeding the transportation structure. Almost like whiteboarding it again, starting from scratch. Yeah, just starting over, right, and saying, just looking around, right? I mean, and, and you know, th this is a great time for mixed operations of district owned and contracted services, right? Because you can leverage off of each other's strengths. I think, uh, Tim, you bring up a good point of, 
um, a lot of times, and I cringe every time I see different districts with the wording they have on there that says, uh, we, state says we cannot, uh, we don't provide service for outside of two weeks. Yeah, and I'm like, all right, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head, Tim. It's a funding, a district decides what it can support based on its resources. Um, and that's the, the communication we have to give out to parents um, that our resources allow us to do this now. I, we're looking at it kind of a backwards plan like Patsy says that, okay, I know for a fact that I must provide transportation for McKinney Vento, Foster, special needs, certain ones that we will provide, but because of federal guidelines, state guidelines, whatever, those are no ifs, ands, or buts. We're going to do that. Start there. Make sure those are all filled up. Then what you have left over, now what can you do with that? What I like about that is it shows you that there you have maybe more control in a time when you feel like you have no control, you probably have more control than you realize. Um, I'm going to coming close to the end here. I'm going to ask Tony uh, mm -hmm. to also to give us a takeaway. I'm going to ask all of our panelists here for starters. This is from Mike Martin. I want to get Mike in on the conversation here a little mm -hmm. bit. I know he's very disappointed about some of the technological problems uh, we had today where he had. Um, but if you had to give a, like an elevator pitch to to uh, someone decision making authority, um, like basically your takeaway, um, what would you say? What's your elevator pitch? I'm going to start with Patsy. Let her start it off and then we'll go down to John, Jim and Tim. Um, and then Tony, I want you to give us a final takeaway and then I'll close this out. Um, what would you want to say to a, a leader who's making these decisions? Um, I, I, my thing would be, there's not a lot of in, in school administration to a degree or you know, kind of higher up the chain that really understands what goes into planning the transportation day. So putting forth our expertise and letting them know that we are a resource for them, that we can share some insight with them and um, maybe maybe give them a little insight into how our day is and what and the things that we can do for them to make their day and their decision making process a little easier. Allow us to work for you and to do what we do best. Very good, very good. John? Uh, basically, question everything. Don't take anything for granted because that's the way we've always done it. Question it. Why have we done it that way? Is there another way? Like the hand sanitizer stuff. I've seen a couple of things in there. Hey, there's non-alcoholic, uh, non-alcoholic, huh. non-alcohol based hand sanitizer. Um, that, yeah, may be more expensive, may be harder to get, but hey, that takes care of the flammability stuff. Can we go get that? So deep dig into it and don't just look at yourselves do stuff like this look at other people look at other districts reach out read there's a ton of podcasts out there now everyone's starting up there's webinars out. It's starting to become zoom overload and go to meeting overload and all that overload but do it get your ideas i think the uh, yeah i think the you know the including the parents in any type of decision making has to be critical um like I said before, I mean, we know that um, part of the uh, economic engine is, is having the uh, education to be uh, an option for parents who, can, who have to go to work. And I think uh, part of that decision of including uh, the parents as part of the decision process, um, I think that uh, we need to make sure that whatever decision we make, we're also uh, sharing those uncomfortable truths as what we what we can really do and what we really cannot do. And I think uh, you know we just need to be completely honest with our with our clientele out there. Very good, very good, Jim. I mean Tim. I, I would want to say tell them that transportation transportation is an enabler of education. It's an enabler of the economy, and it needs to be an enabler of the solutions that come out of this because it will form the core for many districts of freeing up parental access to their work and kids access to education. And as a result, it needs to be sitting at a table and having conversations about what's possible. Very good, very good. Tony, are you there? 
And um, I am here. Yes. All right. So I know you have a direct question you want to ask these these panelists. So what is it? Well, you know, guys, I got to ask you a question because we're, as you know, uh, our clients are uh, they're they're really taking a big step going forward and doing these lo a lot of what ifs. We released a new product uh, over a month ago, about almost two months ago now, and they're realizing this new product helps them, and we really we can't, you know, they're we almost like we're running out of shop, right? Like. <laughs> My dog, of course, dog, you know, keep it real, right, Rick? Uh, we can't keep the shelf right, stocked because they, they want it. But then we're calling uh, prospects and they're saying, well, I don't have the budgets. I can't wait for, I got to wait for the governor to make some decision. I mean, what, what are your recommendations? I mean, we know that they need routing software, but some of them are just saying, I don't know yet. So, I mean, my takeaway is clients completely get it because obviously they already have routing software. But if they don't have routing software, they're thinking, I don't have any money. Uh, I got to wait for the governor to make a decision. So that's the kind of things we're hearing. Any any recommendation on your part? So what's the question directly? So what what is what is it? Are people are just not making decisions? Are they are on a holding pattern. What do you guys? I mean, that's what I'm hearing, right? They're just stopped. You guys have a sense of what's happening in the uh, transportation departments in terms of is there a holding pattern right now in terms of I know we're seeing it in some of the questions here. That it's a wait and see, as several people said, we have a wait and see approach. Anybody else have any sense of that? Right, that's what it, here in Pennsylvania that, uh, you know, the Secretary of Education was supposed to come out with something, you know, a week ago, and then it was supposed to be, you know, tomorrow they're gonna come out, and then now we're gonna push it till July or June 15th. So, you know, there's, I think they're, you know, just, searching as much as we are so uh, no direction don't look for any direction until july one yeah anybody else want to add on that well that's i think that's my takeaway i guess i think i mean obviously i don't want to run, take too much of your time rick i know but i think the takeaway is that there's a massive holding pattern then right well thank you very much Tony. I, I wanna... go ahead patsy so you find, I, mean, that's, I was just agreeing that I think everyone's afraid to make a decision at this point because nobody knows what's coming. Yeah, yeah. That's what, and, definitely and, what we've heard, it seems like, in most of these uh, panel discussions. I mean, even some of the folks asking, you know, can you, can you really, one person said, can you make any decisions until we get a directive on the social distancing on the buses even? I mean, that's, so they feel like, are we, should we even be discussing anything? Question. Go ahead, Tim. I mean, in the scheme of things, do you have a choice but to make a choice? Like, the, it, it, something's going to happen. Kids are either going to go back to school or not. So you're going to plan for both contingencies. And I think to Tony's point, what we have to understand is what are the things that enable us to support that? I think it's the technology component of it is a huge element. I mean, if you just think down the technology stack. The routing software to be able to enable scenario modeling and to be able to look at alternatives. The GPS stack to be able to look at how we can in real time create flexibility in the operation and how we can provide real time notices to people who are going to be incredibly sensitive to it. The parental notification platforms to be able to put information out in the event bus 12 has a COVID outbreak. We can, we can notify people about that. I mean, I think if I, you know, I, I am incredibly sympathetic to the idea that it's hard to make a decision until somebody else makes a decision. But, you know, in the, in the spirit of sort of Jack Bauer and 24, the clock is ticking. And we're going to have to put a knife in somebody's quad here soon because we need, we need to get to decide. Well, I'm going to let Patsy, you said something yesterday um, about asking for permission or something about that. What was that? It's easier to beg for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. So there you go. I'm going to let you have the last word on that. Um, I want you to know, by the way, many people made similar comments. Um, Thomas says, you know, we're, we are waiting to hear from the governor currently developing panels to search out options. Another person said in their state, we have no direction. That's Harold in New York. Um, so I think, again, you guys resonate with our attendees for sure. Um, I want to thank you all for your time. Um, I know you're very busy people, and uh, we just had just a great discussion. And any questions that were not directly addressed, or even the ones that were addressed, we're going to be having answers going out to everybody 
um, in the next couple of days. It'll be on our best practices page, which Tony had already mentioned is on transfinder.com. It's anchored right on our homepage. Um, I wanna thank NAPT and Mike Martin again for your leadership in, in this during these uncharted times. Um, we do have a part two coming up next week. So mark your calendars. And um, again, if you have any stories about how your district is dealing with these issues, serving your community, please send us an email at mystory at transfinder.com. And that may be included in a future webinar, and definitely on our best practices page as well. So really, we're you guys are the solution. You guys are the solution providers. Um, so we're the solution finders, and you guys are the solution providers. So anyway, I just thank you guys so much again. And for all those who are still on, I just want to hope you all have a, a great rest of your day. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. You too. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.